The Boondocks has been a staple amongst our community with its layered social commentary and relatable jokes. The animated comedy series has provided laughs and discussions for many years. Well, today we've got one of its producers, Carl Jones, to clear up many unanswered questions from the beloved show, The Boondocks. Carl, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I, love, I know I said it off camera, but your, your background is very animated. So thank you so much for providing that for me today. <laughs> Um, so I want to I want to dive in first. Just I just want to start with you. Animation, obviously, you know, as a kid, Saturday morning was always the day to get up and watch, you know, this animated series or watch cartoons. For you, how did you start in animation, or when was that passion struck for you? Um, I mean, it was definitely uh, struck as a kid. You know, I mean, I've been, you know, I came from that that Saturday morning cartoon era where you sit in front of a big floor model TV. <laughs> Well, in this case, the floor model TV, I don't even think worked all the time. It was a smaller TV on top of the floor model TV. But um, but yeah, you sit there with a big bowl of cereal and, you know, watching the Smurfs and, and you know, Amazing Spider-Man and and um, Care Bear. I mean, everything. I, I, I watched every cartoon that, that came on Saturday mornings. And, and I think I was addicted to, to animation since I was a kid. Obviously not knowing I would work in the industry, but one of the things I did always noticed even as a child was that there was very few black people in these cartoons so i i didn't really have many characters to identify with which is interesting because i was a big fan of the flintstones and i was a big fan of the jetsons but i i it, to me it seemed like they didn't think black people were in the future or the past <laughs> you yeah. weren't either one of them so yeah that that was one thing that that I, that I took notice of but i was always just a big fan of cartoons in general you know Absolutely. Now, of course, you've been a part of a beloved show um, that's in our community that provides representation of us. When did you actually start in the in the field? Like what what was that point that, you know, you actually were able actually to get your hands on animation series? Yeah. So my, my first, I guess, like unofficial job was actually um, developing a cartoon series for Rockefeller Films. Um, I was living in North Carolina at the time and, and through a friend of a friend. I met the Rockefeller camp and um, long story short, they flew me out to New York to, um, you know, to work, develop this animated series for Beanie Siegel. It was called The Playpen, right? And it was basically, it was basically the Rockefeller rappers as babies in this daycare center that was like a correctional facility, right? So instead of nap time, you have lights out and stuff like that, right? So, so I'm developing this show and then, um, Beanie Siegel gets arrested for attempted murder. You know, so, uh, no no pun intended, it killed the cartoon. <laughs> so when that happened, you know, I was kind of like, you know, because it, it, I thought that was going to be my, you know, this is going to be, this is going to jumpstart my career, right? Like I was going to be able to finally get my foot in the door. So when that kind of fell apart, you know, um, long story short, I just decided to pack up everything and move out to LA, right? Because um, I knew that's where, you know, it was all going down. And the very first day, my very first day in L.A., this is no lie. Like I, I, this my, I stepped foot on the ground and um, and my wife and I at the time, we went to uh, we went driving around. So we went down Melrose. And the only, only reason why we went down Melrose is I knew it from the TV show Melrose Place. So I was like, let's go that way. So we go down Melrose and I see this little black guy walking down the sidewalk with like a a red shirt on and, a, and, a, and the image of Huey on it. And I knew Huey from the comic strip, right? From the Boondocks comic strip. So I like hopped out the car. I literally like, you know, like harassed this guy. It was Aaron Magruder. And so we just started talking on the sidewalk and I was just telling him like, you know, I was just working on this Rockefeller thing. I'm trying to get my foot in the door, yada, yada, yada. We exchanged information. I sent him some samples of my work and then we met, right? And as soon as we met, we just, we instantly clicked. Like we were just on the same page, like, comedically and and at the time there was no show by the way this was this was he he hired me to actually work on the comic strip with him so he and I were working together on that so then when the show picked up I naturally just you know transitioned into the show and we were doing the show in the comic strip at the same time mind blown first of all your first day in LA you take the chance to just get out of the car it's like I, I know this guy let me just let me just hop out that's and I think that's amazing too it just show, goes to show sometimes you just got to fight for what you want and go after other things that you want, and it definitely worked out for you. Now, you mentioned, of course, around that time when you met him, that was when the comic strip, was it as controversial as, you know, the show is now? Because, you know, again, a lot of people love it. People call it, you know, the, they go to it for predictions, 
for jokes and all this. Was the comic view as controversial as the show is? I don't think it was as controversial, but it was more political. It was mm. definitely more political. I think the show was aimed a little bit more towards pop culture. And, and, and so it was more controversial in that way. The, the, the show, I mean, the comic strip was probably, um, you know, it was controversial for what it was in terms of politics and, and, and a lot of Aaron's point of, you know, his point of view on, on politics. But um, we, we actually, you know, a lot of people don't know, we, we actually introduced Uncle Ruckus through the comic strip first. Wow. And and we ran a week of comic strips, and I think it was about Uncle Ruckus going to. If I if I remember correctly, it was one. It was him going to the movie theater, and he was just saying some outlandish stuff in the paper. And so it got taken out of a lot of papers. You know what I'm saying? Like we got dropped. Yeah, from a from a lot of people. So many people complained about Uncle Ruckus. So we had to we had to remove him from the comic strip, and 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 we put him in the show. You know what I'm saying? Um, just wasn't the right place for Uncle Ruckus. You know. Hey, well, he's definitely a legend now. And I think I, I think I said, com I think I was thinking of comedy so much. I said comic view earlier and not comic strip. So my apologies, you knew, but you knew what I meant. I was, I was definitely meaning com comic strip. Um, now, yeah, some of those controversies, you know, Uncle Ruckus obviously is a big one. But as you mentioned, the, com the comic strip just wasn't for him because on screen, everybody loves him. But there's also been some other controversies and a couple of rumors going around, one of those being with, Tyler Perry uh, being upset with his, the way that he was depicted in the pause episode. Was there any truth to Tyler Perry being upset? Oh yeah, it was a lot of truth to him being upset. He, what, he, what, what was said? Did, he, did you actually hear from him or what? How did you know he was upset? Because he personally called the net, at least the way the story was told to us from the network. He personally called the network and basically said, you better not ever, ever air that episode again. <laughs> and, um, you know, I and I, I kind of get it. You know what I'm saying? Like we, and at that time it was, you know, like, I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we were just kind of, I just think like, this is our first time, a lot of us making the show, right? And, and, you know, and we were doing what we thought was funny and we weren't really necessarily taking into consideration like how it would affect people personally or emotionally. We were just, you know what I'm saying? We were young and just, you know, taking shots and doing what what, what we felt. But I do think we crossed the line a few times and in Adult Swim, they used to give us so much room. You know what I'm saying? Like it was very rare they pulled us back. So that's like, cause usually like you have a network that are, if you go too far, they'll pull you back and they'll be the responsible parent. Well, Adult Swim was not the responsible parent. <laughs> they were just like, they were kids like us. They were like, yeah, do it. You know, so, um, yeah, so I mean, he, yeah, I, I heard he got really mad and the episode never aired again on TV. I think it might be on HBO Max now, but I'm not 100% sure. What do, you, what do you think he was exact? What was the point that you feel like crossed the line for him to, you know, actually pick up the phone and say, hey, I don't want to see, you know, I don't want to see this episode aired ever again. What do you think that point was for him? Well, you know, I, I don't think I've told too many people this, but like they, so the episode, the idea of the episode came from one of our actors that was, that was you know, it was a part of the show, um, Gary Anthony Williams, you know what I'm saying, who plays Uncle Ruckus. So he had auditioned for a Tyler Perry movie. And so he was, he was telling us about his experience. And, and so there were certain things that we took from the real story that he gave us and we put in the show. And I think that might have made him feel a way because it was almost like he had a leak <laughs> of someone that was like telling the stuff that we because you know it was like like the prayer circle for example like that was something you know that he did and then we we were also you know Gary was informed that that he might actually you know record those prayers those prayer circles and so that's where we got the idea of granddad you know, his eyes wandering and Tyler Perry caught him through him videotaping those prayer circles and realized that he was not, uh, you know, not ready for the inner circle, as, or at least that's, Gary didn't get the job, by the way. Right, yeah, I, I figure, I, I, I figure he probably did. <laughs> how, but how did, how did you feel at that time, right? Because obviously you were doing something out of, you know, just purity and, and comedy, you know, just like you said, just being funny. How did you feel to hear that Tyler Perry, you know, called the network to, to pull that episode? I mean, at, at the time, it, I mean, it, it felt kind of good just because we, you know, it's like we, we felt like 
I mean, look, man, it's most of the people that we targeted, I feel like are also people that we admired in some way. I know that sounds weird, but it's like, you know, like obviously he's doing, you know, a lot of big things for the for the community and, and for the culture. It wasn't necessarily our, our taste, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So so we made fun of it, but it's not like, you know, there was like a real beef or issue or issue with it. So when, when we saw that he was like affected by it, I mean, it did, you know, it's, it's there's a part of us that was kind of excited about it because we saw that like it, we we did it we did a good enough job communicating these ideas that it actually offended someone because look most of the, the successful shows that I even watch are polarizing like South Park is a very polarizing show you either love it to death or you hate it you know what yeah. I'm saying and so if we're polarizing like that I think that's dope because I know at the other end of that spectrum we got some diehard fans that that will ride with us forever you know. Yeah, and I can't tell you how many times, even on this show, where we're talking about something that's happening in today's time, we're like, wait, wasn't that a boondocks? Wasn't, wasn't that a boondocks episode? Wasn't that something we can recall from that? So, yeah, no, you definitely have your fans. Last question for you on the Tyler Perry. So, I know you said there's no beef. Have you talked to him since or, you know, after that situation happened, were you all able to, you know, at least get on the phones and say, hey, all, you know, all is well, all love, and move forward? No, nah, that that never happened. I know. I know there was one time when I was in Atlanta, and um, I you know it was Michael Jai White. You know, I'm friends with Michael Jai White, and he was he was shooting something with Tyler, and he was like, "Yo, you should come to the set." And then he called me back. He was like, "Ashley, <laughs> Ashley, you should not come to the set." Yeah, no, I I I probably wouldn't recommend it. You know, I would definitely, you know, just wait for that official invitation for sure. But I, you know, like you said, it's all out of love. And I do hope one day, you know, I don't know, maybe there will be some type of sit down just to say, hey, you know, it's all love. So I'll look out for that picture. I'll look out for that. But um, as I said, we also talk about boondocks here on this show. Recently, I don't know if you've been seeing Fleece Johnson has been going viral. Um, have you, have you spoken to him or have you all, you know, kept up? Cause that was another character that a lot of people still today use as memes and, you know, all these things. H have you been able to speak to, to Fleece Johnson? No, I don't, I don't want to speak to Fleece Johnson. I, you know, and I played the booty warrior in the episode, you know what I'm saying? So it, when I, when he got out of, when he got out of prison, I watched like a couple interviews he did. And the first one I was like, oh, this, you know, it's kind of funny. Some of the stuff he's saying. Then it got really weird, and he started going into some, <laughs> some really crazy stories that that helped me to remember that this guy is not really. This guy is kind of, you know what I mean? Like he's 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 a little off. Like, and he's been institutionalized for a long time. So like, I'm like, I'm not. I don't. I don't really want to. I'm not playing games with this dude because DJ Vlad actually asked me to do. A, um, he wanted me to do something because he was going to interview him, and he wanted me to come on the show and do some, you know, do a thing with him out. Uh, I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Actually, Vlad even decided not to do it too because he felt like he didn't want to give this guy a platform to talk about how many people he was. And I, and I kind of understand that, you know what I mean? Because that's a real serious issue. But no, for sure, I couldn't agree more. What was the the inspiration to add this character to Boondocks? Uh, did it, you know, did it come from you? Was it Aaron? Where did this idea come from to add this this character to Boondocks? So, from from what I remember, um. Uh, I, a friend of mine, um, uh, Love Barnett, at the time she was a friend of mine, and she had sent me a she sent me this clip. It was I think it was MB it was an NBC lockup or something like that. It was like a it was mm -hmm. like you know what I mean where where he did this this interview. It was a bunch of it was a, other people other prisoners talking about their experience, but there's something about Fleece Johnson's story that just like I. I you know, and I wasn't hundred percent sure like what the episode was. I just I just took it to the room and and show Aaron and 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 Rodney Barnes and Jamar Taylor, all all our, all our writers, and we started we just started talking about it. And I started like doing his voice, and you know what I'm saying, booty is one part and food. And, and <laughs> he was like, yeah, Aaron was like, yeah, you you definitely gonna play the booty warrior. And and I don't know, it just kind of you know, because we we had already kind of we already established that that Tom had 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 this. Uh, we talked about Tom having this this fear of going to prison. You know what I'm saying? So you know, it was like, well, what if he, what if he was like chaperoning the kids for a scared straight program? Like Hugh and Riley got into trouble or whatever, and it just kind of took took off from there. Next thing you know, Tom is in the shower with the booty warrior. Man, and, and it's crazy too, even when I saw the character, it's crazy to think like this is actually based off 
of a real person. Like this is not just, you know, something that's made up. As your, how did you prepare for the role? Because I know, like, you know, in act, you know, acting and then voiceover, there could be some similarities to prepare for something, especially you having to like say the thing and realize, like, I am embodying somebody that's real. How did you prepare uh, to play the booty warrior? There was no preparation. There was no. I just, I, I just used to do his voice all the time. Like, it's, you know, it was just funny to me, and he said he sounded funny. The stuff he was saying was ridiculous, and I just used to just, I don't know, I just used to do it all. Because I, I would, I would like do. Not like I'm not like an impressionist, but I would do little you know impersonations around the office and stuff like that, and and then you know that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, you I I get it. I just had to ask because just the you know like I said, reading those lines lines and realizing that it's it's a real person. Every time I'm watching, I'm just like okay. But as you guys are you know as you all were preparing for that episode or you know this character, not even the episode that this character. Was there a message that you all wanted to embody or you wanted people to take away from it? Yeah, keep your ass out of prison. That was, that's, the, that's the bottom line. You know, I mean, because, I mean, just the, honestly, for us too, like, on, a, on some real, like, we, when we, just seeing somebody like that, because it was, it was there was some other, in that episode, we actually, we actually, you know, uh, there were some other characters in that episode that were actually, derived from like a real you know some real scared straight um, um programs that we have been watching and that shit scared us right we were like yo like this is crazy like the you know just watching it doing the research for the for the episode was enough to make sure we stay <laughs> stayed on the you know stay out of prison that, i mean it's just scary man like these dudes man, it really is and, and i'm going to use this word like i'm not even gonna say favorite i was going to ask you what's your favorite part or what's the most outrageous part or craziest part for you, because like you said, as you're reading it, you're like, holy crap, this is this is crazy. What was that 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 crazy part? I don't want to say favorite, but if I had to say favorite, what was your favorite part in playing that character? Uh <laughs> it was probably the opening scene. The, the Chris Hansen, the you know, the booty warrior Chris Hansen was probably the most that was the I think that was the that was the craziest thing I think we've ever done. And and Sony had an issue with it at first, you know, like they we it, it's literally when we're talking to standards and practices, their department that that basically tells us what we should and shouldn't do. It it's like it's like it's like you're bartering, right? So it's like you know, give me three assholes and I let you I let you Chris Hansen. It's like you know, it's like okay, take a take, you know, it's like like you you like you literally because because they have this thing called tonnage, right? Where it's like if you have too much of something in the episode, then. You know, you got to remove certain things. So sometimes you can trade, you can do trades, you know, like, we, you know, if we give you this many curse words, can we, you know, do this? Well, um, with, well, with that episode, they absolutely said we cannot rape Chris Hansen. So we had to find like creative ways to do it. So at one point in time, like you actually could see like him moving in the shot, right? When it was happening and they were like, you can't have any camera movement. It can't be. And we were like, what about sound effects? Because we were just trying to, you know, at the time we were just trying to, we were trying to, because the other thing too is we wanted it to be comical, right? So it was like we were looking for opportunities and ways to make it a little bit more absurd, so that you get the comedy of it. And it doesn't come off as too, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. always a risk too, because it's not like it's not a serious sub topic. So you gotta, it's a it's a hard line to walk, honestly. You gotta push the line, see how far you can get over without crossing too far over. Yeah, but can I, like, let me let me just say this too. A lot of times we really didn't actually know where that line was and mm -hmm. we weren't really thinking about, you know, cause, cause I think, I think once it's out, like it's easy to look back and say, well, you know, what were you guys thinking? But at the time, first of all, we weren't, we, we weren't really thinking the show was necessarily going to be like this huge, you know, you know, cultural phenomenon or anything like that. We were just actually like more, it was, it was more incubated and more like detached from the world. You know, like we were just kind of, you know, it, it, it didn't truly hit me what we were doing until the Martin Luther King episode that came out and it was on TV the next day and they were talking about like on like it was like CNN or something like that. And it was talking about, you know, us having Martin Luther King say, say the N word. And I was just like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, we did do that, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like that's when it's because it seeing it on CNN. I was like, oh, OK. Yeah, we did put that out to the world, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I, okay, so now I'm, okay, I want to go back to that, but really quick, just with this, this character, of course, there's so many, where do, what would you rank the Booty Warrior in, in like a lineup of characters? Where would you, where would you rank that? In terms of like, 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 uh, 
Your like your favorite. Oh, favorite. Oh, um, I don't know. He he would maybe somewhere. He's probably somewhere around the, around the middle. I, I wouldn't say he's like my favorite. My favorite is is Thugnificent. <clears throat> That's probably okay. my. Yeah, I think I think he's the most interesting character to me, especially at the time. You know, um, but but the booty. I don't know. He falls somewhere maybe around five. If it's one out of ten. So you bring up Thugnificent. I'll touch on there. How was that? How was that playing that? And what was, again, the inspiration behind bringing him in as well? Well, it was originally supposed to be ludicrous. But but what happened was he he we had this deal. He was like, if you do my album cover, then I, I'll play this role. And so um, when it came time for me to do the album cover, I needed information from him on what he wanted. And I could not get in touch with him. So what I typically do with these shows is I'll I'll attempt the voices until we get the actual actor because sometimes it's hard to get these actors because they got oh, they got busy schedules. So I'll attempt the role at the animatic stage, which is before you go into animation. But once you get into animation, it's a lot harder. Like you got to get the actor in. So we started getting real close to like the cutoff of when you where's the point of no return. Like we have to get Luda in the building, and we could not. We we finally caught up to him, and and then he backed out of the role. Right. And so, you know, everybody was kind of like, well, I mean, you know, you did, the, you, you, you tempted, you know what I'm saying? It sounded yeah. good. It's funny. People's making people laugh when we played it in front of people. So I just ended up doing the role. But that's why I like the, even the cadence was, it was more Luda. This is Doug Nipsons. It was that, it was that Luda from, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. But, but yeah, but I, but what I, but I, what I love about the character too is just that like for that time period, it really spoke to what was happening in 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 the, in the rap world and hip hop culture because it was like, you know, it was a guy who who you know had to had to live up to you know this, this certain image and 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 this this lifestyle that he's portrayed through his music that he really wasn't about. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that was the thing that was really that was really dope to me. And then to see his 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 whole career kind of like fall apart and have to put, pick the pieces back up. Like that's, that was like uh, that character I love the most. Yeah. And, and like you said, it touched on just the state of hip hop and, and what we were seeing. Was there any, well, I know you said he, he backed out, but was there any backlash from, you know, talking about hip hop, even touching on gay rappers and hip hop? Did you receive any backlash from those? No, no, no backlash really. I mean, there was there was a couple of people that was curious to know who, who we were talking like if we were if it was like if Gay Salicious was based on somebody real, you know. Yeah. But I'm not gonna say <laughs> names. But oh, so possibly there's it possibly is based on someone real, just not you don't want to say who. No, but he, he wasn't based on anybody real. It was just it was just kind of like we were just looking at like I don't know this hyper like over masculinity of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Kind of taking the turn all the way until it's like like you know what I mean? It's like I don't know, you know, and then and then it's also just kind of opening up the, the you know, it's, it's just I mean, that's the reality, right? It's like, you know, it's like all this bravado sometimes is is overcome. You know, what I mean, in some cases could be people overcompensating. And 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 if you are, you are. It's no you know I mean, it's like, like, yeah, you know, with this, you know, and that's and that was the other point of it, like because. You know, it's it's interesting because um, I mean, I mean, we, we I mean, it's, we I think the the gay community supported the show really, really hardcore. Like, and I and I you know, and I feel like I feel like for the most part, we did a we did a good job of tackling issues without like trying to like I guess like hammer home like a very specific point of view. We gave different. There were so many entry points into the world. You know, you had Huey and Riley and Ruckus and Granddad from a different age group and. You know what I'm saying? So you had many different perspectives. So we didn't, we didn't, you know what I mean? So you were able to yeah. kind of look at it from many angles. And I think that's what, what kind of like kept us in a, in a, in a safe place too, you know? Yeah. It's been, and it's hard for me to, like, I personally haven't met anyone that just does not like the boondocks. Like you say, you just provide different angles and different perspectives. And it's funny that I feel like that's what comedy does. It embodies what we're seeing in front of us and we make you know we make it funny or we make it relatable and those things so I think you guys have done a phenomenal job with that um so even in hip-hop um and you were talking about Gangsta Licious the story of Gangsta Licious part two comes to mind with the like style trends is it safe to say that the boondocks predicted what the style trends would be in hip-hop because I feel like what we saw then it's pretty darn close to what we're seeing now. Would you say it's it's safe to say that the Boondocks predicted that? Being that you all are the the prediction masters of the culture. 
I mean, it seems like it. I, I, I mean, I'm always amazed. Even to this day, certain I see certain things come out on, like, or people point out stuff on TikTok, and I'm just like, wow, that's crazy. We did do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, yeah. I mean, and I, I, and and we didn't. You know, I don't know. We, at the time, there was still some things going on that, like, like with Gang Delicious, even with this clothing line, you know, that was that was inspired by real things that we that 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 we had saw. For example, like, you know, at that time I think I don't know if it was Kanye West that was wearing like a kilt, but it was like, it was, you know, rappers was wearing kilts. So we were like really long or wearing really long tees that were like down. You know what I mean? So it was just, we were just having fun with that and just like, you know, um and then I think there was like Beanie Siegel had a um I read there was well during the time when he created state property, the clothing line, um the a lot of his clothes got taken out of the stores because he had like hidden gun holsters in the coat, right? So like we were thinking like, well, what if that was like in a skirt? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like it was like a you know, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think he has like I said, did a phenomenal job. Now you mentioned something earlier that was also like an aha moment for you. It was when you saw, like you said, the Martin Luther King um, episode. You know, and him saying the N word. Of course, we would see Al Sharpton speak out about this. One, what was your reaction when you saw, you know, some of that, if you did see it? And then also, too, why do you feel like a lot of people did or some people took issue with it? And was there anybody else that you heard of as well? Well, you know, you know, what's interesting is um, before the show aired, we got a visit from one of Al Sharpton's people, people's right. And they um, they so it, we it, we sat down with them and they were like, yo, we know you're going to say the N word in the show. And, you know, we're going to have to come out against you. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And we were like, okay, like you came all the way here to tell us that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to like, like, you know what I'm saying? Protest the show. And so he was like, but there may be a way to work that this, there may be a way for this to work out for both of us because Al is trying to get into TV and he's got the show and, and mm -hmm. we were like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, so, and, and, and at that point, you know, you know, we were kind of like, First of all, we're, we're going to have real controversy already, so we don't have to like fake some controversy with you, so you can, you know, what I mean, like get into, yeah. And that and that was kind of that that really threw us for a loop too, because I don't know, we would respect them more if it was like a real genuine, you know, what I'm saying, want to, you know, like yeah. I would expect that, but it was more like let's find a way to make this work. And then because we turned it down, they were like, all right, well, you know, we're going to have to come out against you which they did. So when the show aired, they actually, so what's interesting about it, what's more interesting about it is, so they actually staged a protest, right? And it was downtown LA at the same time that the Nation of Islam has, has had a protest about some completely different mm. issue. But they started beefing over the specific area that they were protesting at, and they got into a fight. And so we put that in the show with Reverend Goodlove. We had that that same that same thing happen in the show, but um, but yeah, but that, so we didn't. Outside of that, we didn't really have any real real backlash from it. Uh, you know, it was I don't know. It was you know, and I think it's also the way we did it. We we tried to make sure that like for one, there was commentary in the show about the N word itself. You know, like we did an episode called the S word, and you know, so I mean, I think the show was was smart enough where people people understood that this is not us reaching, you know, for the lowest common denominator. Like we actually have something to say and we're speaking to people, our people in our language, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I will say that's, that's a bit disappointing to hear because it's like, if you're, if you're upset and truly offended, then be that, you know, I can, I can respect that, but don't try to, you know, get something out of it and like, Oh yeah, let's, yeah, that's, Unfortunate to hear, but you know, I think you, I think you all handled it well. And too, it's just crazy how it worked out, and it was perfect for the show. So it's almost like y'all got a double win. Like, right, right, right. Um, now, of course, we would see three great seasons with you and Aaron Magruder. But when we came to the fourth season, that would no longer be. So I kind of want to dive into that, if that's okay with you. Um, and I guess just just right at the top and very candidly, you know, why is that? Why didn't we see both you and Aaron McGruder are part of the fourth season of Boondocks, being that you were so instrumental. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell this from only my perspective, right? Yeah. Um, so 
the, the short of it is um, towards the end of the third season, I started developing uh, Black Dynamite with, with Adult Swim, right? And I think, I think, you know, Aaron, I think, or not that I think, I know Aaron has some, Aaron has some issues with that, right? Because, you know, one, I think because the Boondocks was a really hard show to produce, right? And it was, it was definitely, it took all hands on deck and we worked really hard. All, all, we worked around the clock. So I do understand, you know, he was somewhat concerned about my bandwidth, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, I had to start spreading my own wings and doing doing some more independent stuff. So I, you know, I I, I really I had a I had an idea for this Black Dynamite show. I wanted to pursue it and I wanted to, you know, write the pilot and see what he could do. Never meant to, never was planning to walk away from the boondocks at all. But I do feel like, you know, he uh he was really concerned about me doing other things. I'll just put it that way. I'm trying to find like a, you know, the <laughs> the nicest way to explain this. Uh, cause I don't, cause I don't, you know, I don't want really, cause I got, I got so much respect and love for Aaron and he did give me my first opportunity. So I don't want to in any way make it sound like, you know what I mean? Absolutely like, not. But, but, you know, that, that was a big part of why I walked away from the show because we, we, we kind of got into a beef about that. You know what I'm saying? So, so I, I finished out the third season and then when it came time for the fourth season, like we were completely on, on separate pages. And, um, and so I think he, I, I don't know what was going, cause we weren't really communicating. So I don't know what was going on behind the scenes in terms of why it took so long, but I know I wasn't included in that, in, in that, in the, in the fourth, in the fourth season, right? Like I wasn't, I wasn't being factored in no more cause we weren't, we weren't, we weren't talking. And then, so when the, um, when this, when they did do a fourth season, um, I really can't get into I don't because I don't I wasn't there, so I can't really speak to what happened. But I just know it kind of um, at some point I think it things kind of didn't didn't work out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I know, you, and it seems like you have a lot of love as you. I'm not even seem like you say you know you have a lot of love for Aaron and obviously for the show. I mean the many characters that you did play, you were a big part of this. How did that feel? Because I know you said it wasn't your intention to walk away when you wanted to pursue and spread your wings. How did that feel to you? Did that did it hurt to have to walk away from the Boondocks? Oh yeah, it, oh it definitely hurt. I mean, to be honest, like I mean, I, I miss the show to this day. Like you know what I mean? Like I'm not not just the show. I miss the people working on the show. You know, we we were really like a family. You know what I'm saying? Like like you know me, you know Rodney Barnes, you know Yamara Taylor. You know, um, um, you know, uh, Brian Ash, you know, Aaron, like, I mean, we had, and it was so many times, Sun Kim, you know, I, I just, just to mention a few, but we were really like a close, tight knit family, you know what I mean? So when things started falling apart, like, like that, that was, it was more devastating because Aaron and I were like really, really close friends. I was more devastated that our friendship, like got to that place, you know, over some like business shit. So like that, that, that bothered me, but, but also at the same time, I, I don't think he understands that, like, because the show was so hard to make, and people don't, have, when, when it would take two years for people to see the next season, they don't understand how much work was going into that two years to, to give you what you saw on the screen. So there was many times, I think, where, you know, you know, Aaron would reach, like, a point of frustration with with having to, you know, like, we were making these 22-minute movies, and I, and I saw that, like, at, at some point, you know, I don't know if he want how long he's going to even want to continue to do this because it was it was really hard on on him you know um and and so I you know I started thinking of I got to start planting seeds and doing other things and getting you know what I'm saying like I mean naturally you know I had a family and you know what I'm saying like I gotta I gotta figure out like what my trajectory is going to be for for my career you know without necessarily jeopardizing the show or hurting anything that we're building you know together. You know, I, you know, and that's just how I was always raised like that. I never put my dad always told me, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know what I'm saying? So I, that's I've been I've always thought like that, like, all right, I got this one, but I need to plan. And in this industry, you know, things can be one thing one day and it's gone the next day. You know what I'm saying? So there's plenty of out of even before the strike, there was plenty of out of work writers and producers because they didn't have enough pots on the stove. You, you know what I'm saying? So. I, when I saw that happen, and once I started getting kind of understanding of how the industry worked, I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta hustle, you know. So. Yeah, 
I mean, you're you're definitely in control of your future. So making sure you know, like you say, you're planting the right seeds. Have y'all been able able? Excuse me. Have you been able to talk any since then, or have any type of conversation since that departure? Nah, there was there was a moment where, um, I think it was right before. I think was, this might have been after the fourth season. I can't actually remember when this happened, but because it gets kind of blurry. But there was a moment where Adult Swim called me and they asked me if I would be willing to, um, you know, work through these differences and 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 do another season. And um, I was like, of course, absolutely, a million percent, I'm down, right? And so I think from there, you know, they were like, all right, we're going to, I'm not going to say, but he's like, we're going to call, you know, Aaron and have a conversation and see if we can get you guys to maybe do a dinner or something and bury the hatchet and move forward. And, um, and, uh, and I, he wasn't, he wasn't in agreement with that. So, hmm. you know, and so it, it just, it just didn't work. It just never happened. So we never really had that conversation. And, it, and it's so unfortunate too, because, you know, it, I don't know, man. Like I, like I, 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 I guess I missed the show, but you know, I, I missed the the friendship we had and 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 the whole crew. We were, you know, it was um, and and I learned. I we, I, I think we all learned from each other, and we all brought something really unique to the table. You know, what I'm saying that made it what it was. It's kind of like, I don't know, the stars were aligned, and we had, we just had like a, I don't know, it was just a great fit, you know. Yeah. So. So Carl, let me ask you this. If Aaron was watching, is there anything that you would want to say to him or want him to hear directly from you? Um, I mean, wow. I don't know. I, I would just say that there was, you know, definitely was, I, I've always had intentions on, on you know, uh, continuing to work with him and 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 to make the show and and I I'm you know it's it's just so unfortunate that things played out the way that they did you know and and um I don't know I mean I don't know I don't know what else to say it's you know because I don't think it's anything that anybody did wrong it was just a it was just a it's just kind of how things played out you know what I'm saying if looking back I, I would I would maybe handle I would, I would, I would maybe communicate it a little bit better. What you know, what my intentions were, and what we would, what we were, how you know, or what my plans were, and how you know what I mean. But like, I'm also new to this at the time. Like, this is my first show, you know, so I didn't really understand the game the way that I do now. I just knew that, you know, I need to get some other things going, you, you, you know, at the same time. Um, so maybe, maybe, you know, our communication could have been better on both sides, you know, um, so we understood a little bit more of where we're coming from, 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 from our hearts more so than our minds, you know what I mean? Like, you know, sometimes you can see, you know, we can get caught up in the words and kind of miss each other in terms of what we're really trying to say, you, you know what I mean? Or what's really bothering us, because especially as men, like our egos can get in the way sometimes, but. Um, they do. Yeah. And the, but all, you know, all, it's all. I think it's all love too, because even hearing how you talk about him and still like being very mindful and intentional in what you say and how you say it. Obviously, there's still a lot of love there. So I'll say on behalf of myself, I would love to see Carl Jones and Aaron Magruder just sit down. You guys have a lot of love. You guys have created so much for the culture. But beside all the business, besides all of that, y'all were friends first. So. I would love to see you all, you know, reunite. And like you said, just be able to communicate clearly of what everybody's intentions are because life is just too short. So I would love to see that. And I, I appreciate you for sharing that with me. Um, now, speaking of, of life and of course, as you mentioned, you know, being family there at the Boondocks in 2019, unfortunately, we would see the passing of, of John Witherspoon. Where were you when you heard that news and, you know, what was your reaction to it when when you did catch the news? Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, I know I, I was at home. I, I, I can't even remember what I was doing because I think at, at that time, like, everything just kind of stopped, you know what I mean, around me because I was just like, what? You know, because I, I don't know. Like, John, John was... He was just an amazing person, man. He's just like a really, really, really dope person. And one of one of the best people. And I know people say that sometimes when people pass, you know, the lot, but this he was like really 
a, a special, special person, you know, really caring, really kind, obviously funny, but, you know, he was kind of like a father to us all, <laughs> you know, on, on the show. And um, I tell people all the time, like he, he wasn't, like he wasn't playing the role of granddad. Granddad was, was playing the role of John Witherspoon. <laughs> you, wow. you know what I mean? Like he, John Witherspoon brought, that character to life in a in a really unique way and then so you know the character started being tailored and written around what john does versus the other way around like you know and um but i you know i, I remember going to john's house like for Chris, christmas and he would you know he'd be playing the piano and singing christmas song christmas carols to everybody and like giving out playing being basically playing santa claus giving out gifts and stuff and he would just have like his you know his close friends there and um, he was always just like a really warm, warm person, man. And um, so that 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 hurt. That 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 was uh I mean, I could talk forever about how great he was, but you know, that that was that was a blow for all of us, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've never had the pleasure nor the honor to meet him. So thank you for sharing stories, but even watching his in different characters. I feel like the the character, like you said, plays him more than him playing a character. Because even, you know, like you say, you having the experience of him being Pops or being, you know, that's how he was for us as fans. That's, that was like Pops. And even to this day, I cannot eat a bag of grapes without thinking of John Witherspoon. I do not eat a bag of grapes normal at all. So every time you see me, I will be smacking on grapes, asking you what you're doing in the kitchen. So, yeah, he's, he's always been very iconic. He, but you know, you know what's funny? He's like that. In, he was like that in real life, too. Like with his, with his son, J.D., with his phone. Like he would, he he talks to, I, I would just, when I, when I was like over the house and um, like there was one time I remember he sent, he sent J.D. to the store to get some, some steaks or something. It was some kind of, it was some kind of food from the grocery store. And he had this little purse, like almost like a, let you see, like it was like a little pocketbook kind of change purse thing that he pulled out some dollar bills that was folded up, right? He took the, he peeled off the, the, the dollars and got, and gave him some change too, right? And, and Jamie was like, dad, just give me a, like, give me a 20. Like, what are you, he's like, mm -mm, you don't know how to bring back change, JD. Mm -mm. You, don't, you don't know how to bring back change. <laughs> he was like, like really, and I mean, you know, he had money. He wasn't like, you know, but he was, you know, he's from that, he's from that school and he's, he's that, he's that guy for real, you know? Yeah. No, I, man, I, I can only imagine. I'm literally, I have real tears over here and I'm trying to wipe them, <laughs> trying to say, but no, he, yeah, it's, man, I, I can only imagine what it's like to know him personally. If, if what I feel from just what I see on the screen is real in life, man, what a blessing to be able to have experienced that. So again, thank you for sharing those moments with me because that was definitely someone I wish I, I would, wish I could have met and been able to sit down and talk to just because, like I said, he just means so much to the culture. So yeah, that was a hard one for all of us. But thank you to you know you and what you've been able to do on the Boondocks and other shows. He'll forever live through those characters. So thank you for that. Um, before I let you go, of course, I like to talk about what you have coming up recently. Like you said, you planted a lot of seeds. You've been soaring. So I want to talk about Marsh and Blueberry. If you can tell me a little bit about that, what exactly is it? And and if you could explain, like, what's the goal for it? What what can we expect to see? So Marshall Blueberry uh, started out as an animation studio solely, right? And we launched it during the pandemic, at the beginning of the mm -hmm. pandemic. And uh, the reason why I decided to start this company was because my experience in animation, I've been in the game like 18 years, and every studio that I've worked for, there's always been a problem translating the culture to the artists, the directors, the animators. It's just it's just really difficult, and there's not a lot of us in the industry like you like you would think. You know what I mean? Um, and so um, a lot of the, a lot of, especially since a lot of the 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 animators and the artists are coming out of Cal Arts, and Cal Arts doesn't have a huge you know African American you know what I'm saying um, yeah. student body. So you know those are the people that end up working for the studio. So I I, I so I wanted to especially because of the pandemic, we could really take advantage of. How compartmentalized the process is because we can you know virtually work with anybody around the world so that was an opportunity to really connect with artists in ghana and nigeria and kenya and brazil and and all over the diaspora and basically you know develop this this network of of black artists that understood 
a lot of cultural nuances that that were more specific to us, you know, even if they were from other parts of the globe, you know, and so I, I because that was a need in a in a in a in a niche area that I felt like was overlooked so much, I wanted to cater to that, right? So um, during the pandemic, animation actually started to boom, you know, because everything got shut down on the live action side, right? So you know, we started doing commercials and developing pilots and all kinds of stuff. So um, it's since then it, it's it's grown from an animation studio to an actual creative agency because I I realized that creating IP and going directly to Hollywood with it was not always the best way to do it because number one for number one just for ownership purposes but also like you completely give you know you, you there's there's so many opportunities to build out properties create original properties and exploit various different verticals before going to Hollywood so so now we're we're, we're doing comic books we're also doing um graphic novels and 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 some um, fashion and and um you know games we're actually developing games and nfts which is a big part of what we're doing which i could talk about also but um so so now we're like this this full servicing you know animation studio and creative agency and um yeah and and, and we're growing um and my, my my wife uh love jones now her name was love barnett but it's now love jones is my is is the co-founder of marshall blueberry and we got to we got to we got a strong team. Now, that's a lot of things that you have coming under um, Marsh and Blueberry, but I also want to talk about this fall, you have Young Love coming out as well. Can you tell us a little bit? And that's a pretty big deal. If you can tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so um, Young Love is based on the Oscar award-winning short film, Hair Love by Matthew Cherry. And um, it's going to be uh, on, on HBO Max. Um, Ashley just posted, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I just posted uh, a sneak peek uh, last week on my Instagram. So if you go to I am Carl Jones, you, you can watch it there um, or just Google it. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting project. Um, you know, Issa Rae and, and Kid Cudi are, are starring in it. Um, and and uh, it's, a, it's a fun show. And it's, it's, it's Matthew's love letter to Chicago. And I think it's, you know, for, for me, it was a, it's kind of a breath of fresh air too, because it wasn't, um, it's not as it's not as polarizing and, and and as edgy as the stuff that that you know I I typically do. Um, so I you know I actually was able to focus more on story and 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 character. It's still funny, but but it's not like uh, you know it's not the stuff that's going to get us canceled <laughs> or, or like or, or have Tyler Perry calling you know calling the network saying you better not air this. Um, so so I don't know, but but it's a lot of fun, and I, and I think. Um, I, I think it's it's a it's a show for all ages, you know, for for kids and adults, and I think it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, well, if it's okay with you, once the show wraps, I want to play the sneak peek. We can, if it's okay for us to to put it at the end, I would love for our viewers just to have immediate access to that sneak peek as well. Um, now, before you head out, and before we play this sneak peek, can you let us know how do we keep up with you? How do we keep up everything that you have going on with Martian Blueberry? Um, as well as, you know, just all the things. How do we keep up with you? Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at I am Carl Jones. And um, and then uh, Martian Blueberry, you can follow us at We Are Martian B. We Are Martian B. And then I'm also on Twitter at I am Carl Jones too. So Absolutely. Now, normally I close out and I'll tell everybody, let us know what you think down in the comments below. But since we're going to play the sneak peek, I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce what the people are about to look at. This is a short clip from the first episode of, of Young Love, and um, it's, it's basically the uh, the opening sequence, you know. So um, it's the it's the the title sequence and the opening sequence of the, of the episode. Absolutely. Well, let's take a look and enjoy. Baby girl, I know a thing or two about wigs, and you do not need one. You're getting your hair done now. A good try. I am done. And you are ready for that red carpet, girl. Wait, what is this? It appears a baby has wandered onto the red carpet. I am a refined six-year-old. Sure you are. Security, can you please come get this baby out of here? I, I love it. Whew. I'm so glad. See you in a second.
Don't be up too late. Is she gone? Wait for it. Okay. Now she's gone. Oh, good. All right. How about some Afro puffs? Yes. That will go great with my gown. Your nightgown? Again, figurative. Oh, hello, Regina. What's that? You like my Afro puffs? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.